today we have two speakers who will each present for about 20 minutes each. Uh, and then we'll go into a 20 minute question and answer session. Uh, delegates can ask questions during the webinar by using the questions box on their screens. Send your questions as early uh, in the webinar as you can, as then I can forward them to those speakers in good time. If your question is not answered during the webinar, please do submit it to our forum and we'll address it there. We'll provide the link uh, to the forum at the end of the webinar. Um, if you experience any technical problems during the webinar, you can also use the question box to send a query to my colleague Lorna, who should be able to assist. Um, delegates should also know uh, that a recording of this webinar, along with all the slides, uh, will be available on the Chemical Watch uh, and the PETA International Science Consortium websites in the next few days. Now let me hand over to Gilly, who will provide some information on this webinar series and introduce you to the speakers. Thank you, Philip. Gilly. I'd, I'd like to welcome all the participants to today's webinar on behalf of the Peter International Science Consortium and to thank Chemical Watch for their support in hosting these webinars. The goal of this six-part webinar series is to help registrants plan for the 2018 reach deadline. Hundreds of thousands of animals have already been used for each testing, and millions more are expected to be used in the coming years. However, there are alternative methods that can be used to meet reach data requirements while minimizing animal testing. For more information on minimizing animal testing for reach, after the webinar, you can go to our website, where you'll find a page dedicated to promoting alternative methods. And also on our website, you'll find recordings of all the past webinars in this series. I'd also like to let you know that our scientists are available to assist registrants in avoiding animal testing, so please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Today we are presenting the third webinar in our series, which is focused on alternative methods for serious eye damage and eye irritation testing. Our speakers are Drs. Kim Norman and Jao Barrasso. Dr. Norman works as a toxicologist at the Institute for In Vitro Sciences a non-profit research and testing laboratory dedicated to the advancement of in vitro methods. Dr. Barroso works as a scientific officer at the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternative Animal Testing of the European Commission Joint Research Centre. This organisation promotes the scientific and regulatory acceptance of alternative methods. During the webinar, Drs. Norman and Barroso will first discuss the drivers of in vivo classification for serious eye damage and eye irritation in order to define what is required to achieve full replacement of the animal test. Then the available in vitro methods and how they can be used either alone or in a testing strategy will be described. With that, I'll hand over to Jao to start. Thank you, Gilly. Hello, everyone. So I would like first to thank uh, Pete International Science Consortium and Chemical Watch for organizing this series of webinars and for giving Kim and I the opportunity to provide you uh, an overview of the available alternative methods for serious eye damage and eye irritation and how these may be used to satisfy rich information requirements. So here you can see uh, the outline of our talk today. Uh, I will start by explaining the traditional regulatory in vivo drays rabbit eye test and present you uh, an analysis of a large set of historical in vivo data that was recently published to support acceptance of alternative methods and identify existing gaps that may still need to be addressed. I will then explain the current accepted framework for fully replacing the in vivo test and I will hand over to Kim for her to present you in some detail the currently available alternative methods. I will then finish this presentation by explaining how these methods may be used under reach and how they may be combined in testing strategies where needed to replace the animal test. Next slide, please. So, four different endpoints are addressed in the in vivo DRAIS rabbit eye test, namely corneal opacity, iritis, conjunctival redness, and conjunctival kenosis. Each of these endpoints is independently scored in every treated animal for a period, um, for a period of up to 21 days. The average scores of days 1, 2, and 3 in every animal are then calculated and used to decide on the classification of the tested chemical. The persistence of effects at day 21 is also monitored uh, 
and used to distinguish between reversible and irreversible effects, with the latter being classified as seriously damaging the eye. Next slide, please. This table shows the UNGHS and UCLP classification criteria used in the Dry's Rabbit Eye Test. A chemical does not require classification and labeling, according to UNGHS, if, in the majority of the tested animals, the corneal opacity and iritis mean scores are lower than 1, and the conjunctival redness and chemosis mean scores are lower than 2. If the majority of the animals have mean scores for any of these endpoints above these cutoffs, and all effects are fully reversible by day 21, the chemical is classified as category 2. The persistence or reversibility of effects at day 7 may be used to distinguish between optional uh, categories 2A for eye irritants and 2B for mild eye irritants. But these optional categories have not been adopted by EU in the CLP regulation and are therefore not applicable to reach. Finally, if in the majority of the animals the corneal opacity mean scores are equal or higher than 3, or the iritis mean scores are higher than 1.5, the chemical is classified as category 1. A substance is also classified as category 1 if any of the observed effects persists until they take 21 in any of the animals, or if a corneal opacity score 4 is noted in any rabbit at any observation time. These two criteria apply independently of the severity of scores obtained in the first three observation days. Next slide, please. For more than 20 years, scientists have been trying to replace the in vivo drains eye test with alternative methods. But at present, only partial replacement methods are available, which can be used to partially identify non-classified chemicals and or chemicals seriously damaging the eye. None of these methods can currently be used on its own to directly identify in vivo category 2 chemicals. To better understand the reason for this, ECVAM, in collaboration with Cosmetics Europe and ELS Adrians, performed an in-depth analysis of historical in vivo rabbit data. The main objectives of this study were to identify which endpoints are most important in driving GHS classification for serious eye damage or eye irritation and to evaluate the drugs within test variability in order to propose acceptable and realistic target values for false negative and false positive rates for alternative methods. Next slide, please. I will only shortly present the conclusions of this study in this webinar, so for more details I strongly advise that you take a look at our publication from, from earlier this year, which is available in open access and can be downloaded using the link provided in the slide. Next slide, please. So, in this study we evaluated historical in vivo data coming from four, from four different sources. The first three represent reference chemicals databases that were developed mainly to support the validation of alternative methods. These three databases were pooled and analyzed together, and uh, most of you are probably familiar with them. Uh, the ECTOC database, uh, the ZEVAP database, which was used in the validation of several methods uh, by BFR uh, in the late uh, 90s and the uh, database from uh, Laboratoire National de la Santé, which was used in the initial validation of the BCOP test method by Gotharon. The fourth source uh, was the European New Chemicals database, which was maintained by the former European Chemicals Bureau and contains all chemicals registered in EU by multiple industry sectors since 1981. The table in this slide shows the distribution of uh, GHS categories in both databases. The RCD, uh, the Re Reference Chemicals Databases, contain significantly more classified chemicals than the NCD, and also more Category 1s than Category 2s, which is not observed in the NCD. The distribution observed in the NCD is expected to represent more closely the prevalence of Category 2 and Category 1 chemicals in, in the chemical world, than what is observed in the RCD, since, uh, as I already mentioned, the NCD contains all chemicals registered by multiple industry sectors since 1981, 
while the RCV contains a limited number of chemicals that were put together mainly to support validation studies. What is clear from this table is that the biggest impact on animal replacement will come from alternative methods able to identify non-classified chemicals. Next slide, please. So, when we looked at the different in vivo drivers of classification, we could conclude that iritis rarely drives the classification of chemicals on its own. When iritis occurs, it is usually accompanied uh, by other effects, mostly uh, corneal opacity. So from this, we conclude that there is no need to specifically address iritis in vitro. Corneal opacity and conjunctival redness are the only important endpoints in driving a category 2 classification in vivo since, uh, together, they account for more than 90% of the classifications. Like iritis, chemosis also rarely drives a category 2 classification on its own, and it's in less than 2% of the cases. In 10 to 20% of the chemicals, corneal opacity drives classification on its own, but for almost the double of that, conjunctival redness is the only endpoint driving classification. Therefore, in vitro methods may be, must be able to identify not only corneal opacity, but also conjunctival redness in order to avoid false negative results. And this is an important point since, as most of you probably know, the majority of in vitro methods that have been developed and are available mimic uh, corneal tissue. Finally, when it comes to Category 1 chemicals, we observed that the majority were classified on the basis of persistence of effects at, the, at day 21, but with mean scores of days 1 to 3 below the Category 1 classification threshold, while only about 30% of the Category 1 chemicals showed enough severity in the first three observation days to generate the classification. 80% of the Category 1 chemicals showing only persistent effects had persistent corneal opacity. The remaining 20% were classified mostly on the basis of score 1 conjunctival effects at day 21, which should probably not even be classified as Category 1 in the first place. GHS currently considers full reversibility as zero scores for all endpoints. But, for instance, the US EPA classification considers conjunctival scores of 1 as fully reversed, which actually makes more sense since the classification cutoff is a score of 2, not of 1. Based on this analysis, we concluded that it will be necessary to have alternative methods able to distinguish between persistent and reversible effects in order to achieve full replacement of the animal test. Again, this is quite important since the majority or the great majority of the methods available look at immediate effects and they are not uh, developed to address persistence. Next slide, please. We also explore the influence of within test variability on GHS chemical classification using a statistical resampling technique. This slide summarizes the procedure, the procedure we applied using non-classified chemicals as an example. Basically, we have 1,537 non-classified chemicals in the new chemicals database, which were all tested in three animals. This provided us a pool of 4,611 animals, from which we sampled three animals 10,000 times to derive 10,000 theoretical classifications. We then looked at the distribution of those 10,000 classifications. And as you can see from the second table in this slide, almost 100% of the theoretical chemicals were not classified, which means that the within test variability of the dry eye test for non-classified chemicals is quite low. We also did the same resampling for the category 2 and the category 1 chemicals in our databases. Next slide, please. The conclusions from this analysis are that the overclassification error of the DRAIS eye test for non-classified and category 2 chemicals is negligible. However, at least 12% of the category 2 chemicals could be equally identified as not classified in a repeated test, and at least 11% of the category 1 chemicals could be equally identified as category 2 in a repeated test. Importantly, these probabilities only account for within test variability, and therefore, 
they may certainly increase if between laboratory variability would be considered. The resampling results also suggest a high overpredictive power uh, of the DREZ eye test using the current classification criteria because the distribution the distributions always uh, are always skewed significantly towards lower classifications and never to higher classifications. And the main contribution for this is the fact that uh, category one uh, classification based on persistence of effects usually uh, or is obtained with one single animal, uh, a single persistent endpoint in one single animal, independently of the number of animals of the study in the study. So obviously this is a very conservative approach and uh, and that leads when when resampling to only lower uh, lower distributions and very seldom to higher distributions. So in conclusion these findings should be considered when defining acceptance levels of false negatives and false positives in the development and validation of alternative methods and testing strategies. Next slide please. In the field of serious eye damage and eye irritation, it is currently agreed that no single in vitro method will be able to fully replace the animal test for all types of chemicals and across the entire range of in vivo responses. Instead, combinations of several in vitro methods into testing strategies will be necessary. Next slide, please. A conceptual framework of a testing strategy for serious eye damage and eye irritation was developed in 2005 in an ECVAM expert meeting. Basically, depending on the physical chemical properties and the anticipated degrees or irritation of the chemical, a so-called top-down or bottom-up approach is initiated. If a chemical is expected to induce irritation or damage in the eye, a top-down approach is used with the chemical being first tested with a method showing a low number of false positives when distinguishing category 1 from the rest. If the chemical is identified as category 1 in the first year, it is classified accordingly and no further testing is required. If the chemical is identified as not being category 1, it would then be tested in a second method showing a low number of false negatives when distinguishing non-classified chemicals from the rest. If the chemical is identified as not required classification in the second tier, no further testing is required. Otherwise, further testing would be necessary or a default category 2 classification could be considered depending on the characteristics of the methods used in the first years. The, the bottom-up approach works in the reverse order starting first with a test method able to identify non-classified chemicals with a low rate of false negatives. So, a method that can be used for both identifying category 1 uh, chemicals and chemicals not requiring classification for serious eye damage eye irritation is characterized by two sets of accuracy values, basically two sets of false negatives and false positives. Uh, and you can see that from the schemes on the uh, right hand side and left hand side of the slide. So for, for methods to identify category 1s, you have false negatives identified as the category 1s that are underpredicted as 2s or no categories. And the false positives are identified as category 2s or no cats that are uh, identified as 1s. Uh, on, on the other hand, for bottom up to identify no category, False negatives are determined by ones and twos that are underpredicted as not classified, while false, false positives are determined uh, as the not classified chemicals that are overpredicted as one or two. I will now hand over to Kim, who will present the currently available alternative methods. Kim? Hello, Gilly. Over to you. Thank you. You just need to unmute your microphone, Gilly. Oh, Kimberly. Over to you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, Joao, for that introduction, and Gilly. The alternative methods can be grouped according to the nature of the test system, beginning here with the organocytic assays which are based on isolated eyes or corneas, or based on the chicken-egg chorio membrane, 
The main examples are listed here, which include the bovine corneal opacity and permeability assay, the isolated chicken eye, isolated rabbit eye, and the hen's egg test on the choreoelantoic membrane, or HETCAM. Secondly, the cytotoxicity and cell function-based assays, including fluorescing leakage, leakage, cytosensor microphysiometer, and short time exposure. Next would be reconstructive human tissue model. Um, under that category is the epiocular eye irritation test, or EIT. And lastly, the enchemical assays. And listed here is the ocular irritation uh, assay. Next slide, please. I would also like to point out some of the software tools with functionalities for predicting eye irritation potential. These include Tox Tree, OECD QSAR Toolbox, Derek Nexus, TopCat, MoleCode QSAR Model, and MultiCase. The freely available Tox Tree and OECD Toolbox include the BFR rule base, which applies a set of physicochemical rules to predict the absence of effects, along with a set of structural rules to predict the presence of effects. These, all of these tools may be used in a weight of evidence approach or in a tier testing strategy to inform you on your eye irritation labeling. Predictions should be evaluated using information on the model characteristics. And for classification and labeling, the BFR rule base provides information that is closest to the regulatory goal as the system was designed to predict the then EU risk phrases for eye irritation. Next slide, please. For a mechanistic understanding of the endpoint of eye irritation, we should consider the common modes of chemical action in ocular toxicity, including cell membrane lysis, with, where surface active agents may solubilize membrane lipids, and organ, organic solvents may extract lipids, protein coagulation and denaturation, also including precipitation, most likely caused by contact with acids, alkalis, and certain solvents. Saponification, or the alkaline hydrolysis of lipids, where the effect is often progressive. And chemical reactivity, or those chemicals reacting with cellular macromolecules, a particular concern of these chemicals because of their delayed onset of damage. And these may include um, bleaches and peroxides. And here on the left, we have an image of a cross-section of a human cornea. And I'd just like to point out some of the, the key characteristics, being the one epithelium, two showing the Bowman layer. Three, the large portion of the stroma. Four, the decimus membrane. And five, pointing out the thin layer of the epithelium. Next slide, please. The BCLP assay, or bovine corneal opacity and permeability assay, is a test system which uses cornea which are isolated from bovine eyes obtained from abattoir animals. On the picture on the left, you can see a whole globe bovine eye, which is received into the laboratory, and then the cornea is um, removed from that eye. The, there are two objective endpoints measured in this assay, the corneal opacity, or the passage of light through the bovine cornea, and permeability, as quantified by the amount of fluorescein dye that is able to pass through the cornea, the full thickness of the cornea, um, from being applied onto the epithelial surface. The protocol varies depending upon the nature of your test substance, with liquids being applied neat and surfactants and surfactant mixtures being applied onto the cornea at a 10% um, dilution. And they're exposed to the corneas for 10 minutes with a two-hour post-exposure incubation. The solids are diluted 20% in an appropriate solvent and exposed for four hours with no post-exposure incubation. The assay is validated and regulatory accepted for identifying GHS category one and no category, but not currently for category two. And the OECD test guideline is 437. The assay may be also used in the US EPA program to identify categories one and two for eye irritation. A few uh, points on the applicability and limitations of the assay according to the test guideline. For the no category, there may be a high level of false positives in general. For category one, there is a high false positive rate for alcohols and ketones, and that's using the standard 10-minute exposure. And we found that the three-minute exposure may better model um, eye irritation for these test substances. And there's also a high false negative rate for category ones for solids, but um, relating back to Joao's talk, many of those are false negative for chemicals which are based on persistence without severity. 
I would also like to point out here this link on the tutorial on the BCOP assay. This link is a link to a training video on the BCOP assay, which was prepared in collaboration with the European Partnership for Alternative Methods and IIVS. This video details all of the steps of the assay and is freely available on the EPA A website. Next slide, please. I would also like to point out that histopathology may be used on such organic type of models as the, um, the rabbit eye, bovine eye, and the chicken eye to obtain more information. It may be used to obtain more information on both the degree of damage and the depth of penetration. It also may improve the prediction of chemicals inducing persistent effects without initial severe damage. In this figure, I would just like to point out these are cross sections of bovine corneas which were tested in a BCOP assay. And the image on the left shows a control cornea. And the, the image in the middle is showing a cornea which has been treated with a low level of SLS, which is a surfactant, for a 10-minute exposure. And you see here um, sort of a progressive damage across the epithelium of this cornea. And then in the, the image, um, the third image, you'll see with a higher amount of SLS, you see more damage to the extensive damage to the epithelium and a complete detachment from the basement membrane and a disorganization of the stroma. Next slide, please. The isolated chicken eye uh, assay, the test system is chicken eyes isolated from abattoir animals, and the endpoints are measured are corneal opacity, fluorescein retention, corneal swelling, and morph morphological damage. In the protocol, test chemicals are exposed meat for 10 seconds and excess assessed during a four-hour period. Currently, this assay has an OECD test guideline, 438, and it may be used to um, identify category one and no category. But like the BCOP, it's not able to um, label for category two. A couple of the applicability uh, and limitations for ICE as identified in the test guideline. Once again, there's a high false positive for alcohol and false negative for solids. And and so the third point I'd like to point out here is, although there is this high uh, false negative for surfactants, histopathology was shown to improve prediction for non-extreme pH detergent and cleaning products in a recent publication. Next slide, please. The isolated, isolated rabbit eye test uh, uses rabbit eyes, which may be isolated from abattoir animals or animals which are used for other testing purposes. The endpoints measured are the opacity, corneal swelling, fluorescein penetration, and assessment of epithelial in in integrity, um, two of those which can be seen here on the left, the opacity and the fluorescein penetration in those images where you see progressive damage across those corneas. For the protocol, the liquids are applied as 0.1 mil onto the center of the cornea for 10 seconds, and solids are applied as 0.1 grams. Over, they're sprinkled over the cornea for 10 seconds. And the test materials after that short period are then rinsed and monitored at various times over a four-hour observation period. Currently, the assay has been evaluated in several international validation studies and may be used for identifying uh, GHS Category 1. However, there is not a, a draft test guide guideline for this assay that has been submitted to OECD. The assay has, um, is applicable to a broad range of test substances but like the other models, it is not able to assess reversibility of the corneal lesions. Next slide, please. The HEMS egg test on the choreoelantoic membrane, or HETCAM, uses chicken eggs, which are at the tenth day of embryonation, as shown here on the left. In the assay, coagulation and hemorrhage and lysis are measured to identify either the category one or no category. For the protocol, for a category one assay, you're looking at the time to develop effects during a five minute exposure. And for the no category protocol, the effects are observed at di different fixed time points of 0.52 and five minutes. This assay was validated by ICFAM, but was not recommended and as it needed more data to make further conclusions. However, I would like to point out that an international workshop was held in 2012 and this assay is currently undergoing additional validation. An important point here for the applicability of this method is that it is the only method which is directly addressing those conjunctival effects, which we know are important um, 
as relayed by Joao in his introduction. In terms of the limitation, chemicals that affect the membrane or the readout, such as sticky materials, colored mater materials, and those materials which cause a physical abrasion may be incorrectly predicted, and along with alcohol. Next slide, please. Now moving into those cell-based assays. The fluorescein leakage assay uses the MDCK tubular epithelial cells, and it's measuring a trans epithelial permeability to fluorescein. And you'll see here the image on the left of the inserts and the cells. In the protocol, the test system is exposed for one minute to various concentrations, followed by a 30-minute incubation with fluorescein. Currently, this assay has an OECD test guideline, 460, and it is may be used to identify category one only. In terms of the applicability and limitations, it is only applicable to test chemicals that are soluble or that form a stable suspension at specified concentrations. The assay is not applicable to those strong acids and bases, cell fixatives, or highly volatile chemicals. And colored and viscous chemicals may be wrongly predicted. Next slide, please. The cytosensor microphysiometer, as shown on the left, uses a subconfluent monolayer of mouse L929 cells. The, it's measuring the cellular metabolic rate or the rate of acidification. These cells are exposed progressively to increasing concentrations of a test chemical at a 13.5 minute exposure, followed by a rinse out and then a 25 second metabolism measurement. This assay is currently validated and recommended for identifying UNGS category one for those aqueous soluble chemicals and no category for aqueous soluble surfactants and surfactant mixtures. Like many of the cell-based assays, there will certainly be a limitation for solubility. And so you have to have water miscible solvents or they must be form a stable suspension at specified concentrations. Next slide, please. In the short time exposure test, a confluent monolayer of CERC cells are used to simply measure the cytotoxicity in a very, using a very short time exposure of five minutes. And the test chemicals are exposed at 5% and 0.05%. And currently, this assay is, um, has an OECD test guideline under discussion. And it's been validated and recommended for identifying GHS category one and no category. For no category, there is a high false negative rate for highly volatile, highly volatile um, chemicals with a certain vapor pressure. And for category one, there is an uh, incidence of high false negative in general. In general. And since, once again, since it's an aqueous-based assay, um, it's not applicable to test chemicals that are not soluble or do not have a form of stable suspension. Next slide, please. Next, we'll move into the reconstructed uh, tissue models here. This is an example, the epiocular model, which is, has an eye irritation test, or EIT. In this test system, a non-keratinized multilayer epithelium restructed from primary human epidermal keratinocytes are used to model the corneal epithelium. These tissues are manufactured by Matex. The protocol um, we're going to measure cytotoxicity using MTT, and the protocol for liquids is that they're exposed for 30 minutes, followed by a two-hour post-exposure incubation. And for solids, they're exposed neat for six hours, followed by an 18-hour post-exposure incubation. Um, of note, the solids protocol was optimized during the validation study, and the sensitivity was greatly increased with that change. And the status for this assay is that it's been validated and recommended for identifying UNGH, no category, um, but not able to distinguish between category one and category two currently. And a draft OEC test guideline is currently under discussion. The assay is applicable to a broad uh, range of chemicals. Um, however, you know, intensely colored materials may need to have an additional endpoint to be addressed with HPLC for additional clarification. Next slide, please. In addition to um, the epiocular model, I just wanted to briefly mention that there are certainly you know, other models that are developed, one of them here being the human corneal epithelium model. 
And this system, system is a multilayered epithelium prepared from immortalized human corneal epithelial cells. Briefly, it's, the assay is um, generally similar to EIT in that you're looking at MTT and cyto cytotoxicity as your endpoint. Um, currently, this assay is not considered valid due to a poor sensitivity. However, it had a high reproducibility. And it's undergoing additional optimization and external validation by the method developer. Next slide, please. The ocular ear detection model is an Enchemico method where the test system is a macromolecular matrix which is composed of lipids, glycoproteins, carbohydrates, and other components, components which are integrated to mimic the highly ordered structure of the cornea. We are measuring the turbidity at a certain wavelength, and in the protocol, um, the test system it has a 24-hour exposure to varying amounts of chemical. And then you use a specified protocol depending upon the nature of your test substance, whether it be a surfactant or not. Currently, this assay has undergone an external val validation and now being evaluated by XAM for identifying category one and no category. The assay is fast and simple, and you have a two-year shelf life on the kit that is sold. But there, are, of course, are some limitations with what chemicals are applicable to the assay. pH is important um, for, for those chemicals, which, which may be excluded. And there are certain you know, mispredictions with certain chemistries, as noted here. Next slide, please. Moving on from the methods which I uh, initially discussed, I would like to just simply point out here that these are some of the methods under development to assess, uh, assess the endpoint of persistence, which is lacking currently in, in the models that have been developed. So there are some kind of under, you know, currently some assays currently undergoing some additional validation. I just want to discuss those here, including the ex vivo eye irritation test, which was developed by the University of Aachen in Germany. This assay uses excised rabbit corneas, and it monitors full thickness corneal re recovery over three days using an optical coherence tomography following a 60-minute exposure to solids or 30 to liquids. Next is a porcine cornea ocular reversibility assay, or PORCORA, which is developed by MB Research Laboratories. This assay uses a porcine cornea, and it monitors epithelial recover recovery over 20 days by fluorescein stain retention following a short exposure. Lastly, I'd like to point out the method of um, using the initial depth of corneal injury assessment to monitor uh, or assess persistent effects developed by James Maurer and Jamie Jester. And in this model, they propose that the initial depth of injury is predictive of the degree of damage and duration of inju injury to the cornea. And the corneal is eva cornea is evaluated by histopathology and also live dead staining. Next slide, please. In this slide, this is just a simple overview of those things that I have presented thus far, with those in green showing the assays which may be used to assess no category, and those assays highlighted in red may be used to assess the category one. And here we see in the middle um, for GHS2, there's currently no assay listed there, but Joao will, will discuss with us the use of um, testing strategies to assess GHS2 and how all of these assays may be used for submission to reach. Next slide, please. A couple of practical considerations when you're developing your testing program. First of all, most importantly, it, to determine is your sample being tested for regulatory classification and labeling. If it's not, you may use other approaches for product development or screening purposes. You may use assays that I haven't presented here today, or you can use the assays I have presented, but perhaps with different protocols. Um, and if it is to be tested for regulatory classification, then if so, what is the most appropriate assay system and what is your guidance? So you may want to consider the following, including your physicochemical properties, solubility, um, and if you're working with an ingredient or formulation. And if it's in a formulation, what, what components of that formulation may be um, likely to cause eye irritation? You want to explore the availability of the selected methods to ensure proper assay performance and then prepare the appropriate protocol, which is adhering to the OECD guidance for your selected test, me test methods. 
You want to also ensure proper training on the method, whether, whether you're bringing the method in-house or you're contracting out before conducting the routine testing. And for reach submission, you're going to want to conduct those assays under good laboratory practice compliance using all the control, controls and assay acceptance criteria as outlined in those test guidelines. And concurrently tested benchmarks or reference samples may also be useful. And I believe that concludes my portion, and now I'll turn it back over to Joao for additional discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Kim, for this excellent uh, presentation of the available alternative methods for eye rotation. So I will now try to briefly explain how the various in vitro methods that were presented by Kim can be used under REACH. REACH Annex 7 uh, and 8 define the standard information requirements for serious eye damage and eye rotation. Annex 7 defines the standard requirements for substances manufactured or imported into EU in quantities of 1 to 10 tons per year. And Annex 8 defines the standard requirements for substances manufactured or imported into EU in quantities of 10 or more tons per year. As you can see, in vitro methods are already a standard information requirement under Annex 7 and therefore need to be performed to assess the serious eye damage eye irritation properties of a substance. On the other hand, the standard requirement under Annex 8 is currently the in vivo DRAIS eye test. However, since the annexes are cumulative, a, regist a registrant should nevertheless perform in vitro methods to fulfill the requirements of Annex 7 before considering an in vivo test under Annex 8. Next slide, please. I sh it should also be mentioned here that the Commission has recently proposed a revision of these two annexes to the EU member states where in vitro methods become the only requirement under Annex 7 and an in vivo study under Annex 8 can only be considered if it is demonstrated that the available in vitro methods are not applicable or are not adequate for classification. If the proposal is approved by the member states, uh, these annexes may be revised during the course of next year. However, to fulfill the requirements of Annex 8 with in vitro methods, a registrant currently needs to submit the data as an adaptation of the standard requirement and provide an accepted waiving argument. Next slide, please. Oh, it's okay. It's this one. So, no, previous slide. Thanks. So, Annex 11 describes the general rules for adaptation of the standard testing regime set out in Annex 7 to 10. Point 1.4 of, 1 of this annex regards the use of in vitro methods and describes the waiving arguments that can be used for adapting the in vivo study requirement of Annex 8 with in vitro methods. In vitro methods that have not yet been validated but that are su sufficiently standardized can be used to identify positive results. Negative results obtained with such suitable methods would still need to be confirmed with an in vivo test. However, Scientifically valid methods may also be used to identify negative results and therefore the provisions on F of Annex 11 allow for the replacement of the in vivo test for serious eye damage and eye irritation since, as explained by Kim, there are already several in vitro test methods that are considered scientifically valid to identify non-classified chemicals and some of those have already been adopted as test guidelines by the OECD. Next slide, please. An important document that should be consulted before generating data for fulfilling REACH requirements for serious eye damage and eye irritation is the REACH Guidance on Information Requirements and Chemical Safety Assessment, Chapter R7A, uh, Section R72 on Irritation Corrosion. This document provides a guidance on how to fulfill REACH information requirements using different types of information, including alternative methods, and includes a general integrated approach to testing and assessment which can be very helpful in structuring data collection and data generation where required. This guidance is currently being updated to accommodate the various new test guidelines and guidance documents that have been published in the last years. This update can be followed through the link provided in the slide. The European Commission and the US have also jointly submitted to the OECD a new project proposal for the development of a guidance document on an integrated approach to testing and assessment for serious eye damage eye irritation. So more developments to come in the near future in this area. Uh, the OECD will um, uh, decide on the approval of the project proposal in April next year. Next slide, please. Other official documents summarizing the available in vitro methods for serious eye damage and eye irritation are shown in this slide. 
and it can be downloaded using the links provided. Um, I strongly recommend the read of the State of the Art Review on Alternative Methods that we have produced for ECA and that was recently published. Next slide, please. So, I move now to the last part of this webinar. This table shows the accuracy values of the various in vitro methods that can be used or have been proposed to identify non-classified chemicals. You can see that all these methods are characterized by a very low uh, rate of false negatives. Um, the values in brackets correspond to the accuracy values calculated when removing chemicals out of the applicability domain of the methods. However, all these methods are characterized by a, a, a significant number of false positive results. That means uh, non-classified chemicals that are identified as positives. Um, the, amongst these, the ones that show uh, lowest uh, false positive rates are the isolated chicken eye, the epiocular um, eye irritation test, the short time exposure and the ocular ear detection. All these false positive results uh, would require further testing if following uh, the, the bottom-up strategy. So after the first year, they would be identified as positives and they would require further testing. Next slide, please. So from the, the slide uh, before, you can see that uh, one should start a bottom-up approach with one of the methods showing lower false positive rates. That is the epiocular the isolated chicken eye, the ocular detection or the short time exposure, taking into consideration uh, with, uh, to their applicability domains and their limitations. Uh, one important aspect that I would like to mention here is, I mentioned in the first part of my talk that uh, conjunctival effects are quite important and, uh, and they would need to be addressed in vitro. And uh, none of these methods, maybe apart from ADCAM, apparently addresses conjunctival effects directly. However, from the validation of all these methods and the very low false negative rates, it, you can already see that uh, methods that the chemicals that are classified in vivo based only on conjunctival effects are actually not underpredicted by, by these methods. So, in fact, although uh, we need to address the endpoint, so far from the available data, none of these methods seem to have uh, a specific limitation in identifying, correctly identifying chemicals that are classified based on only on conjunctival effects. Now, 60 to 80 percent of the, of the non-classified chemicals should be identified with a single method and with less than 5 percent false negatives. So, already here you can see that and also taking into account the prevalence of, of, of uh, industrial chemicals. Um, that I presented in the beginning of the talk, you can already see here that for the great majority of the chemicals, you would be able to come to a conclusion on the basis of a single method. In some cases, more than one method will be needed. Uh, and this, of course, in case you, you obtain a positive result in the first year. Uh, and you would need to, to, to do further testing in order to decrease false, false positives. But because these, all these methods are char characterized by very low false negative rates, you can actually combine one or two, two or three and you will increase the number of correctly identified negatives without really a, 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 an important impact on the false negatives. Moreover, uh, most methods can be used to identify both category one and no category. And this, of course, increases the efficiency of the strategy because with one single method you can act actually identify uh, both ends of the scale. Next slide, please. So, now the, this table here presents the predictive capacity uh, of uh, the various methods that Kim uh, described, but now for the identification of category 1 chemicals. And um, you can see that all these methods are characterized by uh, rather low uh, rates of false positives. That, that is, uh, chem chemicals that are not CAT1 but that are identified by the methods as CAT1. Um, and conversely, uh, they have, uh, uh, some of them, uh, significant rates of false negatives. So chemicals that would then require further testing um, after the first year if you follow a top-down approach. What is interesting is that uh, most of these false negatives um, are coming from uh, chemicals that are classified based on persistence of effects only, without severity uh, in the first three observation days in the DRACE test to generate the category 1 classification. Next slide, please. 
So now, based on those, on those uh, values, um, it is um, clear that one should start at the top-down approach with one of the methods showing lower false negative rates. And uh, that would be the cytosensor microphysiometer or the bovine coronal capacity and permeability test or the isolated chicken eye if you are uh, testing surfactants and you are coupling the method to histopathology evaluation uh, like mentioned uh, by, by Kim earlier. 15 to, to 50 percent um, false negatives which are under predicted category 1 in each of these methods um, so you, you obtain about 15 to, to 50 percent false negatives in each of these methods and, and these are mostly chemicals that are classified in vivo based on persistence without severity. However, as Kim also explained, there are already some methods available, non-standard methods, non-validated methods, but in vitro methods, um, that can be used to, to uh, uh, address the persistence of effects and persistence versus reversibility. And I note here um, Evite and Porcora. And you should remember, as I mentioned before, according to Annex 11, you can use uh, non-validated methods that, that are sufficiently standardized to identify positives. So if you actually uh, use one of these methods to identify persistence of effects to clarify a category 1, um, you are certainly able to do that under reach. Now, um, so if you, if, and if you do that, if you, if you address persistence of effects and you, um, you actually, uh, and you can actually increase the coverage uh, in the detection of no category and category 1 by a combination of uh, more than one method to identify uh, non-classified chemicals and methods to identify persistent, you could actually increase the, the confidence in the default category 2 classification in the last year. I note again that this would be uh, the minority of the situations because as I explained uh, before, in the majority of the, of the situations you may be able to identify a chemical with a single test. But if you are not able to do that, um, if you address persistence and you combine more than one method to identify negatives, you actually may be able to justify a default category 2 classification in the last year. Uh, next slide please. So, to conclude this talk, um, I would uh, like to, to, to mention the following point. So, as I explained before, in vitro methods are the standard information requirement and the reach for substances produced between 1 and 10 tons per year. For substances produced between 10 and 100 tons per year, the in vivo test is currently the standard requirement, but this can be adapted with use of in vitro methods using the provisions of Annex 11.1.4. It is estimated that at least 70% of the substances, uh, for 70% for of the substances, one single in vitro test method will be sufficient to derive a final conclusion on serious eye damage eye irritation if the method is carefully chosen. For 20 to 30% of the substances, a combination of two or more methods may be needed. And importantly, full replacement may be achieved in the majority of cases if due consideration is given to persistence versus reversibility. And I conclude here uh, the, the talk and I uh, open uh, the panel for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Hal, for that, uh, that talk. And thank you also to Kim. Um, I think, yes, we should open the questions. Um, we have uh, uh, quite a few of those. Um, firstly, um, uh, to um, go back towards the beginning of the talk, so I guess this will be uh, for you, Hal. Um, uh, how could um, in vitro tests be used to justify uh, specific concentration limits for substances to be used for calculation uh, by the uh, additivity methods? Um, yeah, I think that question came up also in the skin irritation and corrosion um, webinar, if I recall. Um, I, I cannot give a, a, a direct question. I think they, they can be used, um, but honestly, I would not uh, know how. I don't know, Kim, do you, do you have any idea um, on how to reply to this question? No, I don't think I have anything further. So uh, what I, what I uh, propose is that we, uh, I will check in and, and maybe provide a reply written at a later stage, if that's okay. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Um, uh, to take another question then, um, 
Um, in the validation of in vitro methods, um, the DRAES test uh, is uh, used as a basis, but uh, how well does the uh, rabbit eye predict the human response with respect to eye irritation? So I can start with that. Um, I mean, for um, eye irritation, the situation is a bit more complicated than for skin irritation, uh, for instance, because in skin irritation, we do have uh, some uh, high-quality human patch test data that have been used uh, to, to compare to the dry uh, skin, skin data, and they actually have been mentioned in a test guideline for 439 on skin irritation. And, and from there, um, it's, it's clear that the dry test in, uh, is more towards over-predicting uh, the human situation than, than under-predicting it. For eye irritation, there is no, um, as far as I know, no really good uh, high-quality um, uh, human data, uh, and most of the evidence comes from accidental exposure. Still, um, it is from the available evidence, um, um, we, the, we, it's clear that the, the DRACE test uh, rather over-predicts the, the human response, also from the nature of the test itself, because exposure in the, in the DRACE is maximized. Uh, in the older studies, um, there was no washing permitted, uh, and, and solid materials sometimes stayed in the eye for uh, long, very long periods of time, which obviously exacerbated the, the, the responses, and many times delayed effects can be, could be seen um, due to, to uh, secondary infections uh, coming from just abrasion and not really direct uh, chemical action. Um, also, the interpretation of, of the DRACE data using GHS criteria, as I explained before, is quite, um, quite uh, stringent, which certainly would lead to overclassifications. Uh, nevertheless, the DRACE test is the, the regulatory method, and when trying to, to um, implement alternative methods, uh, we are always faced with uh, direct comparison with the DRACE. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, it was important to analyze exactly the limitations of the DRACE and uh, analyze uh, what we can obtain from the DRACE so that we can facilitate re future replacement. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, can we now turn perhaps to Kimberly? Um, there's a question here. Um, uh, does the um, globally harmonized uh, system uh, recognize the uh, ICA, the isolated chicken eye assay, um, for classifying uh, eye irritation? Yes, um, under UNGHS you could use the ICE assay to classify severe eye irritants category one or no category based on the scores in that assay but you can't use for the category um, two. Okay, well, that's a clear answer to that question. Um, uh, we, um, uh, this is probably for how this, this question. Um, we recently uh, had to submit, uh, the questioner asked, uh, we recently had to submit samples for several eye irritation uh, and damage tests when working with a consultant in Germany developing um, global uh, harmonized um, system uh, compliant uh, safety data sheets for the EU. Uh, do these tests have to be performed uh, in the EU as opposed to the US to be considered valid? Um, so I, I'm not sure if, if I understood correctly, uh, but um, methods that are accepted um, in OECD guidelines uh, basically, results obtained with those methods should be uh, accepted across the globe uh, because they are covered by mutual acceptance of data. Of course, um, uh, all these methods that Kim uh, described uh, are uh, mainly applicable to GHS, but actually, um, VCOP and ICE uh, are, all, uh, are also accepted for ones for EPA, uh, US EPA for instance, uh, not necessarily for, for uh, non-irritants, uh, because there the GHS and US EPA uh, classifications differ uh, uh, a bit. Um, some of the UN GHS not classified chemicals are classified under US EPA as category 3, so the methods do not work exactly the same way for GHS and US EPA. Um, but, uh, but for one, certainly they can, and, and US EPA has also uh, uh, 
an, a strategy uh, accepted for uh, antimicrobial cleaning products that uses um, BCOP, cytosensor and, and epiocular, although using a different epiocular protocol um, using time to toxicity. I, I'm not sure if this was exactly the question. I, uh, if to, in order to generate information for uh, MSDSs, I guess, yes, the methods should be, should be accepted for that. I, I don't see uh, any reason why, why not, since usually uh, in MSDSs the classifications provided are GHS. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you for that answer. Um, uh, another question here to the, to the panel, I think. Um, there's a, lar a large number of possible test methods for in vitro, uh, in vitro test methods. Um, guidance and annexation uh, mention appropriate, uh, sorry, guidance and the uh, annex mention appropriate tests um, and general points, but it's very hard to conduct the right test. Is there further guidance on the usage and methods uh, available or at least planned? So, uh, which methods do you choose, basically? Uh, well, uh, yeah, Kim, go ahead. <laughs> I can take that. Um, just to begin, that's why I had the, I know we presented a lot today and a lot of different methods um, on the slide with the practical consideration. We kind of, kind of go through that checklist first to really think about um, what are the physical chemical properties of your sample and then to go through and decide which assay is the best assay based on just the limitations of each of the assays. And then once you've selected those assays, which are most suitable for your test material, to then you can explore the availability of those methods and make a decision whether you, you, know, you can speak to a reliable contract lab and see if they can perform that assay or you consider bringing the method in-house and you need to you know, always ensure proper assay performance. So I think if you go um, generally from that perspective, you should be able to pick um, an assay which suits your test materials and your end goal based on what are the characteristics of the test sample and which category are you intending your sample to fall in, be it a no category or perhaps a GHS-1. Okay. Um, the, uh, perhaps, um, a couple of important questions here. Um, are, the, are these tests uh, applicable to nanomaterials? Nano have they been used for such? Ah, um, well, very good question. Um, well, the question of nanomaterials is obviously uh, coming up now. Um, as far as I know, well, certainly in validation studies, not yet. Um, so, I mean, they may have been used, I, I'm sure they have, but, but, but by specific uh, companies or industries. Um, but no, no, no data that I personally have seen. Um, uh, the, 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 the question of nanomaterials is, is coming up um, at the WMT level, at the OECD, and, and um, certainly people are starting to discuss the applicability of the various methods uh, to nanomaterials, and one of the first cases is, is genotoxicity, where, uh, for instance, uh, uh, discussions are going on on the applicability of the micronucleus test to, to test um, nanomaterials. Um, so far, um, the, the, the approach of the OECD has been that um, uh, nanomaterials could in principle be tested, um, like, and the approach is similar as the one taken for mixtures. Um, they, they can be tested unless uh, proven uh, contrary. But, but the question with nanomaterials is, is much more complex, and, and therefore I think this will have to be addressed uh, in the near future, basically uh, on one map, one, one, one method at a time and a, a, on a case-by-case -case basis. But in principle, um, with nanomaterials, mostly the question is about uh, characterizing, characterizing well what's being tested under the test, test conditions uh, and uh, because uh, the actual form of the chemical under testing uh, becomes crucial, especially in methods that are, are uh, done under solution conditions. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a very quick question, probably a long answer. Um, what are the average costs of these tests, in vitro tests? Can anybody answer that one? 
Kim, do you want to take that one? Sure. I, I can give some, some general guidance on that question. So as compared to um, the DRAES test, I would say that these assays that I presented are generally in the same range as, as uh, that test. It may be more expensive, um, but it, it, of course it's going to depend on your testing needs. If you need to test done GLP, um, what are your requirements in terms of your reference chemicals and benchmarks? In general, these tests, uh, since I'm in the U.S., like I mentioned, in, in, in dollars, you know, you may be looking at, you know, around um, $1,000 to $10,000 for an individual test or a series of tests to assess a certain endpoint. Uh, but I would say certainly all of these assays are within a, a similar range to each other for the ones I presented, although, you, you, you know, you're going to have some differences um, based on the model you're using. And they're also within the, the same range as um, testing with the DRACE test. But for specific testing information, I would rely on talking to, um, you know, your contract labs or a consultant or determining how much it would cost for you to bring the assay in-house and run on a per chemical basis. Okay. Okay. Um, Kimberly, a, a, a question uh, specifically aimed at you um, by the questioner. I mean, how... Um, uh, can in vitro or in silico um, approaches address uh, chemicals that are not classified because uh, conjuncti conjunctiv con conjunctival redness or um, uh, chemosis and lesions uh, subsequently disappear in the DRAES test um, within the observation time? See, that, that one may have a challenging answer. I have, may have Joelle join in, but um, with the, certainly with the in, in vitro methods there, there are currently methods including the BCOP assay and the ICE assay which can be used to label um, no category or essentially non-irritating. So those assays currently may be used to label or I guess with the absence of labeling for a category of eye irritation. Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, as Joelle mentioned, for the HETCAM assay, that's the only assay that's really been clearly identified to assess those conjunctival effects. And we, I'm assuming we'll kind of begin to learn more and more regarding the testing strategies. But currently, we do have two assays that can be used for um, the no category. Yeah, I, I can add to that just to say that, for instance, in the validation of the epiocular and the skin ethic, in, during the chemical selection for the validation, we specifically uh, selected chemicals that were classified based on, on uh, the DRACE, uh, based only on conjunctival effects and mostly conjunctival redness, but also chemosis. And uh, all of those chemicals, all of them, 100% of those, were correctly identified by the epiocular, which is not surprising because um, conjunctival redness is mostly an inflammatory uh, response, which is associated with cytotoxicity. And you know, in the end, you're measuring cytotoxicity in in the in the epiocular. Um, I've also looked through the the the, the uh, databases, the validation databases of BCOP and ICE, because those are also quite extend, extensive. And also, there, none of the, the chemicals that were classified in vivo based on conjunctival effects were mispredicted. Um, so, I, I mean, as I said in my talk, at the moment, um, I, I don't see any limitation towards conjunctival effects. Um, if, the, if the effects reverse, I mean, if they are low level, uh, that they do, jump, do not generate a classification, in principle, uh, you know, they are uh, either correctly predicted by the methods or they are over-predicted. Um, but uh, there is no correlation, uh, specific correlation on overprediction specifically for these. They are as overpredicted as chemicals that are um, that are showing on corneal uh, opacity. Um, if and if they if they uh, persist and would generate the category one classification, then we are uh, entering the, the the discussion on on persistence versus reversibility, which we have also covered in the talk. Thank you. Um, we are overrunning sl uh, slightly, um, but uh, there are just a couple more questions to ask. Perhaps I can ask them together, um, and uh, then we can uh, wrap up. Um, there's a question here um, uh, aimed particularly at uh, Hao, uh, which is um, to address the issue of uh, mixture classification in eye tests. And um, the the other one, uh, the, the the final question is: um, 
do, does that anyone on the panel have uh, any suggestions on which assays uh, could be used to tease out category two compounds? Okay, so I, I can um, maybe start with the, the first question, um, which was, can you remind me again? Uh, the mixture classification. Uh, the mixture, yes. So for, for um, BCOP and ICE, the, the methods were actually validated with, with several mixtures. Um, they were included in the validation study, uh, and both methods were, were found to be applicable to the testing uh, of, of uh, formulations. And they included uh, several types of industrial, industrial formulations, uh, not only cosmetic ones, but also uh, from other, other sectors. Um, in terms of the, the, the reconstructed tissues at the ocular, for instance, the validation study did not include uh, mixtures because obviously the, the, the BCOP and ICE were validated uh, by retrospective evaluation and uh, all their data were acquired in parallel with, with in vitro and in vivo studies. So uh, formulations could be included several years ago. Nowadays, obviously, it's not ethical and we would not uh, be able to test in, in parallel in vivo and, and therefore to include formulations in validation studies is, is quite complicated. But industry does have historical data on proprietary uh, formulations and, and for instance uh, at a, a recent expert meeting on, on uh, eye irritation at the OECD where the epiocular guideline was discussed, uh, BSF presented a, a, a recent data they have acquired on hundreds of agrochemical formulations that they have, for which they have uh, trace, uh, historical trace data that they tested in, um, in epiocular and they obtained uh, an accuracy of 80% and sensitivity and specificity almost identical to the ones obtained with substances in the validation study. So, um, actually, uh, from the data we have, it seems that the methods uh, that are available are applicable to mixtures without, without problems. But, of course, depending on the mixture or, or the product you want to test, uh, you may have sometimes to adapt the protocol slightly. Um, that will all depend on, on what, you're, what you're testing and the specific characteristics of the formulation. Okay. Um, anything to add to that, um, uh, Kim? No, I don't have anything additional to that. Okay. And the the um, the um, uh, anything on the uh, which assay should be used to tease out category two compounds. Well, um, at the moment, there is no in vitro, in vitro method um, adopted by the OECD or being proposed or, or being validated to directly uh, identify category 2s. Um, the the PORCORA and the AVITE um, uh, methods that, that Kim mentioned um, do, do uh, allow for the identification of category 2s, um, but uh, apart from, from persistence, of course, the biggest problem in identifying category 2s comes from the underclassification of, of category 1s based on persistence. Because the overclassification of no categories, of non-classified chemicals, can be overcome by combining several methods. Because uh, the methods to identify negatives have so high uh, sensitivities that you can combine two, three of them and you will not increase the false negatives and you will end up probably identifying more than 90% of, of the negatives. But the persistency is still an issue. So these methods that are able to, to identify persistence to some extent obviously become also useful in identifying category 2. Um, but, you know, if, by, uh, if I think if people are able to identify persistence either by one of those methods or by other means, uh, basically you, you will come to a situation where uh, category 2 can be uh, identify by default without the necessity to act actually have a method to directly identify category 2. Okay. Um, well, Kimberly, unless you've got anything more to say, I think it's time to wrap up. It's now 5.15. Um, and uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to both our speaker, uh, well, all of our speakers. Um, uh, Gilly and Gilly and um, uh, Ki uh, Kim and uh, Hao and um, thank you um, 
to all the delegates listening in uh, to make this webinar such a success. Uh, I gather we have about 500 delegates signed up to this event, um, which is uh, a good number. And um, I'd like to um, wish you all the very best of luck uh, as you go about your work in this field. And uh, thank you for listening in, and goodbye.